We are having fun. We're going to get really heavy. You absolutely need a Bible tonight. We're going to be uh, really digging in and uh, jumping around a lot. This is kind of like an overload tonight as we're talking about the most important geography in the entire world. And if you don't understand the geography of this place, you won't understand the Bible. And that's, that's a bold statement. But let's go down that road together and see why, why I would say that. So, Father, we love you. We praise the Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, you just bless our time tonight. Lord, that we'd hear your voice, Lord. And Lord, just trust in you tonight as we go through this study of the Bible, Lord, study of this, this, this wonderful place called Jerusalem, Temple Mount. We love you, Lord. We trust in you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen and amen. All right. So going to Israel, when you first see this, this vision right here, this, this site right here, you'll never forget it, especially for the very, very first time. So, so you have what you're looking at is you're looking at the Dome of the Rock. We'll get to that. Hold your horses. We'll, we'll, it's going to take us a little bit. We've got to work our way up to that. We'll talk about when that was there, what's under there. This is most likely where the temple stood. But you remember there's a problem with that from last time because of that gate right there. And if you're not familiar with that, we'll get over that again. We'll look at that again. But this is what we're, we're heading towards because we need to know what this geography is like, what this temple is all about, what that structure, Antonio Fortress is all about, what the mikvahs are all about. You need to know this because it's so much part of our Bibles, so much part of understanding what God was all about, you know, as far as wanting to meet with his people. What is the, today, and we'll get into this as we go along, I'll pause and we'll, I'll do a whole little study on this for you guys, is this why Christian baptism, what is that all about? It goes back to these areas right here. There's a bunch down here called mikvahs. Mikvahot, plural, it's, it's ritual baths that they were doing. What was John the Baptist doing? He wasn't doing something new. He was doing something they were already doing. He was giving a new understanding to it. If you're not familiar with that, stay tuned. We'll get to that down the road as we talk, uh, talk about um, mikvahs and that. Because as you go around this building, so much of our story comes alive and is part of, of what we believe and what we study here in the Word of God. The temple, Solomon's temple, this is Herod's temple. Later on, the tribulation temple. Later on, the millennial temple. And so we'll hit on some of that. So going around this structure, what we already did is we went all the way back to the very beginning. And by the way, this is a crash course on this. All right, I'm missing some key things as we go along just because we would have to spend six months looking at this topic. All right, so I took you all the way back to Genesis 22. That's what we did last time. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him on a hill that I show you. That is one of the most wild lines in the entire Bible. Take your son, your only son. That's a problem. We talked about it last week. Whom you love, first use. That's the first time that word was used. We may know to that. And offer him on the hill. Take your son, take him up on a hill, and kill him and burn him. All right, he's not talking about a neighbor kid. That, that might be more doable. Probably not either, but, but your child that you love. Now, again, if you weren't here, then, then you missed the whole thing and you're just not as educated as the rest of us. There's a problem with that picture too. Remember last time, okay? He's not a child. Okay? This, this guy's in this, this uh, uh, laughter is his name. Isaac is in his 30s. Okay, and so again, the chronology of this thing. So we went there, and we talked about that last time. Go online, you can watch it online. I think they're doing these online, I think. Somebody told me that they didn't. Anybody see these on, outside of Facebook? Are they online? You see? Okay. Somebody's told me today that they, they didn't see them online. All right. All right. Okay, so then we went from there, then we went to Moses. Moses. Now, if if... If Moses does not look like Charlton Heston when we get to heaven, I am going to have, I'm going to be really upset about that. However, if you listen to audio Bibles, and you really should, we live in a great generation. You should listen to the Bible on audio, put it in your car when you, when you have downtime, whatever, listen to the Bible on audio. One of my favorite ones is the Word of Promise. Jim Caviezel did that. He's the guy that played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ film. That's his project. He put it together. When he got to this guy, 
Moses, they had, who did they have do that? Richard Dreyfus. That was extremely hard to deal with, and yet it was typecasting because the Bible says that when God was trying to get Charlton to, to do this part, you know, when he was trying to get Moses to step up and be the deliverer, Moses says, you know I can't speak well, all right? You know, I know I'm not a man of words. I can't speak well. And so that's interesting. So that doesn't, what does that have to do with, with our study tonight? Nothing. I just wanted to say that. And also, here was a cool thing from last time. Remember this? We almost had those displayed at our church. Almost. So close. So close. And then they found out they're worth millions of dollars and now they're gone. Okay, so that robe actually was on display. This whole setup outside of Charlton Heston, it was on display in, in Salt Lake. In Salt Lake. Uh, back, what was a couple years ago, three years ago or so, downtown, they had a big display of this, of this, uh, this movie. Anyways, okay, so, so this, he came down the mountain, so this picture is, is, is right, might be wrong, came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and maybe engineering scrolls, however it came down, he had with him, implanted in his heart, his mind, maybe in some kind of writing, he had the, had the uh, specific details to this building. And this, this is going to lead us up to, we're talking about the Temple Mount area. You can't, unless you understand the geography, take your son, your only son, who you love, offer him on the hill that I show you. That hill is where the temple stands. How significant is that? That hill is where Jesus was crucified. Again, we cut all that last week. And then we, go, then we go back, what is the structure on that hill? You got to go back to this structure. So you got the, ge this, the, the physical geography, and then you have the building that's on there. Both of those you need to understand for so much of our Bibles, because this is a major, this right here, how to build this every, every, every second, what the sockets are supposed to look like, what, you know, how they're supposed to be made. Every aspect of this thing is detailed, tedious detail in our Bibles. All right, so, so here you have the, the tabernacle in Shiloh for all those years. We talked about that last time. And that leads us up to, turn, turn your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel to this, this event right here that this little cartoon is, is spelling. Out. Uh, David's desire to build a temple, and that was his heart. Lord, let me build a temple for you. In 2 Samuel, you have this story. And again, I'm going I'm to I'm encourage you to go back and read the context because I got to hit it really fast to get as far as we want to get tonight. All right, so, okay, so 2 Samuel chapter 7 says this. It says, now when, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, 2 Samuel chapter 7, said to, to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Lord, ah, hold on, okay, a little dark up here. But the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, uh, do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the Lord said to Nathan, uh-uh, no way, Jose, he's not doing it, all right? That's a very loose translation. So what he said was, and, and David, this guy, David, he had such a heart for God, though he, he was... He was a mess up on a lot of fronts, but he loved God. And he's sitting in this beautiful palace. And he looks out the window and he sees this, the, the, the tabernacle. He sees the, the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is in a tent. He goes, I live in this beautiful house of cedar. Look what God's house is in. And he gets the prophet Nathan. He says, Nathan, I, I'm gonna build, I want to build a house for the Lord. Nathan goes, whatever's in your heart, do it. But then Nathan goes home that night, and, the, and God is all over him saying, no, you, don't tell, you tell David no. Um, he, tell David, I didn't ask you to build me a house. I have not asked for anyone to build me a house. In fact, I'm not going to build you. I'm not, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a kingdom, a dynasty. And so you look down to verse, um, jump down to verse, well, verse 11 from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, said God speaking, and I will, I will give the rest of all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord has made you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I'll rise up uh, your offspring after you and you shall come from, from your body and I'll establish his kingdom. 
and he shall build a house for my name. And I'll establish that this is what's on the Temple Mount. This is the building that was there. You're not going to build it, but your son is going to build it. Solomon is going to build it. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Listen to that relationship that we can enjoy today with God. You're his child, and he loves you. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. And when he has committed iniquity, which he will, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. My steadfast love, I will discipline him. He's my son. I will correct him. But, he says, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. I will. Boy, that's just a, that's a good father right there. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your, uh, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. I'm going to bless you. David, you can't build the house. And I'll show you in a minute why, a little bit more detail on this. Why well, couldn't do it? You can't build the house, uh, but your son will. And even though I'm going to have to discipline him, and boy, Solomon had to get disciplined. Solomon was told not to amass horses, not to have, because horses was like the military power of the day. Not to do that. What did he do? Amass horses. Was not to, uh, not to bring in a bunch of wives, because they'll turn your heart away from God. What did he do? The dude, the dude, all gone to wives, you know. Um, and, and you know, and so his might was not to be in. And now understand this too. Let me let me let me pause that just for a second so we understand that the the wives that he had was not just because he is a pervert. He wanted a bunch of wives. All right, that was political alliances with the surrounding kingdoms. And this is really important of what he was doing. It showed his power. So if I if I want to have uh, if I want to have a peace treaty with, with uh, and I'm in Jerusalem, and I want a peace treaty with Egypt, then I'm going to marry his daughter, and we're going to be family. And that's what a lot of what was going on with Solomon was, is that it showed his power, it showed his status, but it's also his alliances with all these other kingdoms around him, right? And so that's a big piece of what was going on with Solomon, all right? Yeah, he's, he was you know, but also check this out though. You get to the book of Ecclesiastes is this, and this is Solomon now at the end of his life, an old man, and look how bitter he is. Everything he had, all the blessing that he had, you know, all the riches that he had, he had everything that you could possibly satisfy this flesh with. And he talks about, he says, it's vanity. It's all vanity. It's like chasing after the wind. It means nothing. If you want to boil all this thing down, understand this. And in just a couple lines at the end, you know, fear God, serve God. There's a judgment day coming. That's it, you know. And so, but you just read it. When you read that book, I remember teaching it here, this was a few years ago, teaching the book of Ecclesiastes and just, just wanted to say, dude, happy up a little bit. You need a happy pill because you are so depressed, you know, just, you know, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. And he goes on again. And then a few, few lines later, vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. You know, you just want to slap and go, go, be quiet. God blessed you with so much. All right, anyways, that's his son. So, so he says this to him. He says, David, you cannot build the house, but your son will take it right in your Bible. Go to First Chron- Chronicles 22. Now it comes, now his son is, is of the age, David's getting older, and it's time to begin to get Solomon going, building the temple. First Chronicles 22. First Chronicles chapter 22, look at verse, we'll start in verse, um, verse 6. First Chronicles 22, it's in the extremely clean portion of your Bible, all right? which we need to fix that for you guys. Okay, First Chronicles 22, start at verse 6. And then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord. All right, so again, keep it in the bigger context. What we're talking about is the temple that stood on Temple Mount area that, that Abraham offered Isaac on. It's the threshing floor of Aruna that David purchased. Okay, that's a story that we didn't spend a lot of time on. And so now it's time to build the house. So build the house. David said to, to Solomon, he said, my son, 
He said, I had it in my heart to build the house to the, to the, uh, to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great war. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. You are a man of blood. Now, if you watch David, you know, I did a, I did a series here back just a few years ago. I did a series on the life of David. I, mean, I don't know if you guys were part of that. But, but when you track with David's life, this guy was brutal. This guy was brutal. He would go into a town and slaughter everyone so they wouldn't catch wind in the, the surrounding areas that he was, he was um, you know, coming through the town. I mean, this guy was pretty brutal, okay? And so you have too much blood on your hands. It's in, you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, behold, a son shall be born to you uh, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all the surrounding enemies, which he did. There was peace in the area, the era of Solomon, for his name shall be Solomon. And I'll give him peace and in, in, in quiet to Israel in the day. He shall, he shall build a house for my name's sake. He shall be my son and I will be his father. And I'll establish uh, his royal throne in Israel forever. Uh, he's going to prosper, keep my, keep my law, keep the law of the Lord your God. Uh, down a little bit further, down verse 13. Then you shall prosper if you be, are careful to observe the statute. So you need to follow God, do the right things. He did prosper. And when he got off track is when he began to violate the very, the very uh, you know, what, what he had with God was a, there was a you know, honor system. There was, a, there was an honor there. God blessed him. And yet he violated that. To this day, it, when you go to Israel, there is a weird, it's hard to see, when you're stand, so the, the Mount of Olives, I should show you a picture of this. I'll try to remember to, to get a picture of this. When you stand on the Mount of Olives, okay, um, you're not going to see it. But when you're on the Temple Mount area, looking on the Mount of Olives, if you're right, on the, if you're right at the Temple Mount area, um, okay, if you're on the Temple Mount area and you, and you look straight across, that's the Mount of Olives. If you look right, there's a, there's a pyramid over there. There's a weird pyramid. That is the tomb of one of Solomon's wives right there. Even that is the, the, the pagan stuff that was there. Even that, you still see the, the, the things from that uh, just today, which is really weird. You go, what is that little, it's hard to see because it's really cluttered and some, there's some businesses over there and stuff. So there's a little pyramid over there. That's one of his wives. And the Bible says that the wives are going to turn your heart away from God. So, so, so David's telling them, look, you're going to prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules of God, uh, commandment Moses, that, that, that Moses gave for Israel. Be strong and courageous, fear not. Do not, do not be dismayed. With great pain I have, I have provided for the house of the Lord. I've, I've collected everything. A uh, um, hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, bronze and iron beyond their weight. There's so much of it. I got piles of this stuff. You're ready to go. I've got timber and, and, uh, and stone. I provided workmen and stone cutters and masons and carpenters and craftsmen. I've given you everything, gold and silver, bronze uh, and iron. Arise, get to work now, kid. Get to work. The Lord be with you. All right, so this whole section here in 1 Chronicles 22, it's David saying, look, I've given you everything. I've supplied what you need. I've given you 100,000 talents of gold. One talent is 75 pounds. One talent is 75 pounds. You know, Lord, I don't need 100,000 talents. Just give me, one, give me one talent of gold. 75 pounds of gold, all right? So you start doing the math. I got, I got out the calculator and I get this. Okay, now how much? Is, so 75 talents of gold, 100,000 talents. Uh, so you start doing the math and you can trickle this down to, to what it would be worth today. He, he had just in gold, he had $180 billion of gold, of just gold. He had, he had $19 billion, billion dollars of silver, piles and piles Monster piles of silver. These are monster boxes. You know about that? All right. These are, this, is, this is a lot of gold and silver. But even that now, and I, this is what happens when you start getting on the internet, then you start going, well, I wonder what the national debt is. Okay. It's like, yeah, it's not in the billions. You know, it's in the trillions. Okay. So this pile is going to take 25 more piles just like it to get the national debt. All right. 
In other words, in America, we're in trouble. All right, that has nothing to do with our story. It's just, it's just amazing. Have you ever gone over there? This is like, I like home Bible study. This is like a home Bible study. Hey, how are you doing today? Hey, have you ever saw this website and, and stuff? But uh, if you go over there, it's, it's got a clock on it and shows you what the national debt's doing. All right, and it's, it's pretty frightening when you look at that. All right, what does that have to do with this? Absolutely nothing. I just wanted to say that to you. But so what he does is he says, look, I have given you everything to build this temple. I can't build it because I'm a man of war and God, God has, has made it so I can't do this. But he said, you're going to do this and he's going to build this, this temple to the Lord. Now, this is amazing. Think of all the gold, all the silver. Now, when Nehemiah, and we won't, well, maybe we might get there tonight. We'll see how far we get. But when Nehemiah goes to rebuild the temple, because the Babylonians are going to destroy it, when he comes back to rebuild it and he gets it done, they begin to weep because those that remember the glory of Solomon's temple, they say, this is not even, this is nothing like Solomon's temple. Think of all the gold, all the silver. And I'm going to show you, this is going to help us a little bit because here we could get stuck for weeks and weeks. And we've done this when, we, when we've, ta- we've taught uh, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We taught those books. We're going in detail on this thing, all right? One thing that's interesting because of where we live is this, and, and, and then I'll, we'll do a little short video. It's a little short one. To kind of do a little tour of it. But uh, is this little structure right here because of where we live, all right? Isn't that interesting? You ever see this right here? Okay. <laughs> what is that? Well, for, for our local group, it's a, it's a baptismal. Uh, but that is not what it was. What it was. This is the laver. This is the the brazen. The 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 brazen. The the, the um, what's it called? It's the bronzy, but it's, the, it's called the brazen brazen. The laver. Yeah, I got that. It's called the. You guys, the front row. You should know this stuff. No, no, no. You're dumb, dumb as I am. All right. So so okay. It's the sea, but it, there's a like a like the molten sea. That's it. It was there in that file way back there. Okay. So it's kind of a weird thing that they called it. All right, this held 12,000 gallons of water. This is so the priest, and it was, it was um, in, the, in the tabernacle, it's, it's a lot lower so the, so the priest could see his reflection and all that. Here, this is for the priest to clean himself so there's going to be a way to get water out of this thing. And this is some, some other structures to get water out. But this is to, to be able, because this is a bloody place, what they're doing there. This sacrificial system that's happening here is really bloody. So you have this, this, uh, this, this sea, they're calling it. All right, so, uh, but there's so much detail about this. Let me get over to that here. Okay, okay, so just take just a minute. This is like a, I don't know, three, four minute thing, and this will help us. It's so, God is so specific. On this structure right here, he's so detailed. Here's just a little glimpse of the detail, and you can reconstruct this completely by the detail he gives. Okay, see if this play. Little short video right here. And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. And the porch before the temple of the house Twenty cubits was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and ten cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. And for the house he made windows of narrow lights. And against the wall of the house he built chambers round about, five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber of cedar. The nethermost chamber was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For without in the wall of the house he made narrowed rests round about, that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber, and out of the middle into the third. And the house, that is, the temple before it, was forty cubits long. And the oracle in the forepart was twenty cubits in length, and twenty cubits in breadth, and twenty cubits in the height thereof. And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, 
and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, within and without. And the whole house he overlaid with gold, until he had finished all the house. And for the entering of the oracle he made doors of olive tree. The lintel and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. So also made he for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors were of fir tree. The two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other door were folding. And he carved thereon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work. And Solomon made all the vessels that pertained unto the house of the Lord, the altar of gold and the table of gold, whereupon the showbread was, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left, before the oracle with the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars was lily work, so was the work of the pillars finished. And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, and three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. And it was an hand breadth thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup, with flowers of lilies. It contained two thousand baths. And he made ten bases of brass. Four cubits was the length of one base, and four cubits the breadth thereof, and three cubits the height of it. And on the borders that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, and cherubims. And every base had four brazen wheels, and the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. Then made he ten lavers of brass, One laver contained forty baths, and upon every one of the ten bases, one laver. And he put five bases on the right side of the house, and five on the left side of the house. And he set the sea on the right side of the house eastward over against the south. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. The thing about the the Bible is that God will tell them, this is how I want you to build it. And then you'll get, then you'll get, the preparing for it, and then the next section will be they're building it, and it's the de- same detail. So there's so much details. Now, I meant to tell you this, is that uh, a cubit is what? Right here. From here, from here to here. That's how they measure, about 18 inches, right? And so a hand breadth is right there, the width of your hand, all right? So, so it's different ways of, uh, of measuring, but you can get specific details on this, uh, on this temple. And just to to see the, the beauty of this thing. Solomon really went all out, but he had the workmen, he had the, now that, now part of the workmen too were, were slave labors. And, and, you know, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem even tonight as we talk about the divided kingdom, what happens here. But uh, so you have this temple that's there, this beautiful, this is right on the Temple Mount area. It's right where Abraham offered uh, uh, Abraham I offered Isaac, right? So it's right there on that. This is that temple is right there on that, on that structure. Again, it's, it's a holy space and the building is holy. The building is, is, is very specific. So this stood there and when they, so they got it all done and God shows up. Second Chronicles chapter seven. All right. And we'll just read just a little bit of this. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, okay, and you can read all the context of this, as they're dedicating the temple, he finishes his prayer, all of a sudden, fire comes down from heaven, consumes the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the temple. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord 
uh, glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces in the ground and pavement and worshiped, gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, uh, for his steadfast love endures forever. And you keep reading there, but, but here you have this, now the dedication and God shows up. God shows up in this big fireball from heaven, which we have seen, you know, several times happen throughout, throughout the, the nation of Israel. You know, you think about, um, about, uh, who was it? It was, um, oh, there's a couple of them. You can find yourself. <laughs> I'm starting to get tired already. Is this what it's like to get old? <laughs> okay. There's many times God showed up that way. All right, so, which would have been, think about the celebration that would have been there, to know that God was pleased with this. And for 410 years, this building is going to stay there, is that structure is going to be there for 410 years. And that, that takes us now, if you've seen this before, this is very helpful, uh, the panoramic uh, view of the Bible, following the genealogical trail. So as we're following this, and this is how we're tracking through the Bible, is we're following the genealogy all the way from Adam, all the way to Jesus. So as we track it through Joshua, Judges, Saul, and, and, and David, and you get to Solomon, this is where we're at right here. Solomon builds the temple there, and, and Solomon reign has reached the height of the nation's glory, also the beginning of a tragic decline because of Solomon's sin. God, was, God wanted so much as he wants to bless people. And yet, if we want, and that's what David told him. And David understood that if you obey him, how many times, just go through, get a concordance out, look how many times that it says, if you obey God, this is God's blessing on you. But if you do not obey, remember it wasn't long ago, we talked about the, the, the blessings and the cursings on Mount, on Mount uh, Gerizim. And, Mount, and what was the other one? Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Thank you very much. Is on those two, on those two mountains where they took half of the, the nation of Israel, part on one hill, one on the other, and the blessings and the cursings. Okay, this is what's going to happen if you follow God. Man, things haven't changed. If you follow God, there's a blessing on your life. There's a blessing. Doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. Sometimes it's hard. Hard things come at us, but there's a joy in the journey. But when you're disobedient to God, man, stuff comes at you hard and fast, right? And so, so Solomon began to compromise, and it caused a lot of problems. In fact, when he died, when he died, what happened was the divided kingdom, all right? So you have here Rehoboam is his son. Jeroboam was a general, and he's been kind of ouched by Solomon, so he's kind of on the run. And so you have Rehoboam. So now Solomon dies, and you have and you have Jeroboam. A way to remember this is Jeroboam, Jeroboam jumped, Rehoboam remained, all right? So, so Rehoboam remained in with, 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 uh, with Judah, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, and then 10 of the tribes going up with Rehoboam. What happened was, is that Rehoboam, uh, he was, he, the, the people came to him when Solomon died, and the people came to him and said, look, your dad was really hard on us, and if you just lighten up, we will serve you. We will do all that we can to, to make sure you, it's a success in what God is doing. And so we want to serve you. So Rehoboam goes and he gets the, and, and Jeroboam is, everybody's, everybody's on the same page right here. And they say, look, we will serve you. Just lighten up a little bit. Your dad was really hard on us. He was slave labor and stuff. So just lighten up and we'll serve you. So he goes to the old guys that was the old guard and asks them, say, what do you think about what they're saying? The old guard said, well, you need to listen to them. You need to listen to them, and they'll serve you. This will be the glory days of Israel. But he gets to his friends, the young millennials of the day, all right? He goes to the young guys, and what does the young guys say? The young guys say, no, don't do it. They're a bunch of whiners. They're a bunch of whiners. In fact, you go tell them this, and this is what he tells them. He says, my dad, he, he whipped you with whips. I'm going to whip you with scorpions. You ain't seen nothing yet. You think my dad was hard? I'm going to be hard with you. And what happens was what we term in our Bible called the divided kingdom. Okay, the divided kingdom. You know, two tribes here, main tribe is Judah, here stayed in Jerusalem and up here. Now, th this story right here, by the way, uh, you've already heard 
because when we were looking at all the way up in Dan, remember we talked about the golden calf up there. Do you ever remember that? What is that golden calf? So he made, so Jeroboam, Jeroboam jumped, Rehoboam remained, Rehoboam's the son. So Jeroboam taking the 10 tribes up, up to the, up into the north, as he was up there, they don't have the temple. So the people said, well, we, we want to go back. We need to go back where the temple's at. And he, so he built two golden altars, two altars, put golden calves on there and said, and that one was up in Dan. We can still see where it's at. If you were, when we were part of that study, you're, we've been at this for a long time. But if you, were, if you were there for that, you saw, we could still see where the golden calf was at. Right? And so, and trying to appease the people. So you have Jeroboam up in the north. You have Rehoboam down in the south. Now, here's what happened. As they begin to split, as you go through history, every once in a while, these, these two groups are fighting each other. They're not getting along most of the time. Up here in the north, this is Jeroboam, uh, Jeroboam's group up, the ten, the 10 tribes. These kings over this period of history right here, these kings, there's not one of them that's a good guy. These guys are all messed up, all right? And so... And so eventually the Assyrians will come down, the Assyrian captivity, 2 Kings chapter 17, all right? And so, but down here with, with Rehoboam, and then here you have, you have bad king, bad king, good king, revival. Bad king, bad king, bad king, good king, revival. And so you have, and it's, it's almost like these guys are watching, these guys up here getting, getting just beat to spot, all right? And so, uh, and so these guys are behaving themselves a lot, a lot better. Plus, they have, they have uh, Joel and Jeremiah, Habakkuk. They have Ezekiel and Daniel, Obadiah. Uh, you know, so they have all these prophets there. Now, these guys had Jonah and Elijah, and they had their own prophets up here. So why is this important for our study of Jerusalem? Is because as you're going along, the temple's still standing, boom, until you get right here in this Babylonian captivity. captivity. The Babylonians came in and completely destroyed the destroyed Solomon's temple, right? And we spend a lot more time in kind of piecing all that together as your as your Bibles tell the story of each one of those judges and each one of those each one of those kings and as as we go along in that time period. But what we're interested in is is this is this structure right here. The Babylonians came in. It started off with the Babylonian Empire. They came in and then the Persian Empire came in. And there is such a really cool story about, let's, let's do this backwards, about this guy right here, about Cyrus. All right, so you guys doing okay? This is a lot right here. All right, so go to Isaiah. Let me show you this. And then we'll just, I'll tell you, I'll just ad lib the story. I'll tell you the story, what happened. And then, uh, and then we'll quit, all right? So go to Isaiah 44. This is such a cool passage in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 44. Okay, so now... This is going to talk about um, them coming back. The Babylonians have come in, have destroyed uh, the temple, and we got to get to Nehemiah and Ezra. They're going to come back into the land and rebuild the temple. All right, so Isaiah 44. And now here's one of those places, classic places in our Bibles, that the translators put a break in the, put a chapter break where it should not be. There's a couple places like that. The, the, the text is anointed, the chapter breaks are annoying. All right, and this is one of them where the chapter breaks annoying. There's a couple of them in really bad places with prophecy. All right, this is one of them. So you're going to go to Isaiah 44, look at verse 27. It says, this is a prophecy concerning uh, them coming back into the land. Okay, uh, who says to the, to the deep, be dry and I will dry up your rivers. Okay, as I read this, keep, keep this in mind, all right? There's, this is going to be fulfilled some... 200 years later, right? So this is the prophecy, right? There's going to be a river that's going to be dried up. There's going to be an individual that's going to be born. His name is going to be Cyrus. He is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purposes, saying uh, of Jerusalem, uh, she shall be built. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Chapter break, wrong place. Thus says the, the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, to loose the belt, to loose the loins. Okay, that's the wording right here. To loose the loins of the king. 
Okay. To open, now listen, listen how specific this is. This doesn't make any sense until you see what happened to fulfillment of this. To open doors before him, that gate may not be closed. Okay, so there's a, there's a door that's open and a gate that's not closed. There's a river that's dried up. Okay, I will go before you and, uh, and level and exalt places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the brass of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in the secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, I'm doing this. Uh, the God of Israel who, call, who called you by name. Cyrus, I've called you by name. He's not even born yet. Right? This guy's not even born yet. Uh, for the sake of my servant Jacob, for Israel my chosen, I will call you by name. And, uh, I name you, though you do not know me. What a cold little prophecy. And it was silent for 200 years. What is that? We don't have a clue what that means. We don't know what Isaiah is talking about. This guy comes on the scene. His name is Cyrus, exactly as the Bible said. All right, Cyrus comes on the scene. Okay, so in, in Daniel chapter 5, we don't have time to go there, you read it later, is the Babylonians are there. They're, they're, um, they're, all, they're all huddled up. And, uh, and on the, uh, in, in Babylon... All right, so in on the wall, as they're parting. So, so they're, they're there. This is Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belteshazzar. So they're there, and they says, hey, let's party. Go get the, remember we slaughtered Jerusalem. Remember we took those guys out, and we had all these golden cups and stuff. Go get those. Let's party with those tonight. Ooh, don't, do, don't take God off. So as they're partying and getting drunk, all of a sudden, a finger writes on the wall, meeny, meeny, tickle your farson. Or as, as uh, J. Vernon McGee said, meeny, meeny, come tickle the parson. <laughs> Never mind. All right, meeny, meeny, tickle the parson. And so they didn't know what it meant. They're freaking out. All right, they're freaking out. So he gets, he gets Daniel to come in. He gets these, these to come in. And, and he's, Daniel tells him what that means is, it's saying this, your kingdom has been weighed. It's been found wanting. While this party's going on and this big scene's going on, Cyrus is on the move. Cyrus is coming in. How they took, how they took this place, how they took Babylon, is this, is the, the Euphrates River, when right, it's a, it, this massive walls all the way around. I think Jericho was huge. This is massive walls. They said you could take six chariots on top of the walls, side by side, and run, do chariot races on the walls. That's how thick the walls were. So how are you going to get into this place? Euphrates River ran right through, was one of the features of Babylon, ran right through the middle of, 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 this, of, this, of the, the town of, the, of Babylon. So they have the Euphrates River. So what Cyrus did is he diverted the water. Okay, that's going to help. You're going to get the water. So now, now you have a channel to get through there. But they have these huge gates that go down. You know, the water can get through, but it's huge iron gates that are going down. So you can't get in there, right? So what happened that night? Those gates were left open. What does the scripture say? The gates are going to be open. The gates were left open that night. And he comes in through there exactly as if they're going to dry up a river. The gates are going to be opened exact two, 200 years before Cyrus is even born. This takes place. Now, why is this an important story? Because Cyrus is going to be the one that's going to give the, give the call to come back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So meeny, meeny, took you a and they're, they're doing it. This guy says to him, says to Daniel, hey, I'll make you, you know, I'll give you a power. I'll give you gold chains. I'll give you everything. Just tell me what it means. And Daniel goes, I don't want any of this stuff. You, dude, you're dead man. All right, you're a dead man. You're going to die. And he did die. Cyrus came in, took him out. Now what's cool is in our church and only in our church, okay, there's only two of these that I know in the entire, this is probably not totally true, but it's true to me, so it's just important. There's only two of these that I know in all America, because I got two of them. I had two made, two of these made. It's this cylinder right here, and I gave one to Chuck Missler, a friend of mine. I gave one to Chuck, and then we have one on display out there. This is the Cyrus cylinder, right? Now, I, now the, the, uh, uh, I think the British Museum has, the, has what they think is the original, okay? Do they have the original or do we have the original? It's just, just saying. Okay, and I don't remember what cases are. These cases are phenomenal. Go out there and look around these cases. Somewhere in one of these cases has this cylinder. 
Now, what is this? This is, this is all writing on it, and it is, and you can go online and you can read the translation of this. This is Cyrus talking about how he was, you know, through Marduk, his God, following, following his God. And remember, in, the, in the, the prophecy was, you don't know me, you don't know Yahweh, but I'm going to use you, and I'm going to name you by name. Well, he didn't know. Marduk was his God. And so he talks about how Marduk gave him power to let, and the, 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 the lines that are important to us is, I allowed the Hebrews to go back and rebuild their temple. And he's, ta- he's bragging about letting them go back and do the very thing that the scripture says that they were going to do, right? And so, so very cool. That's still pretty cool. I had this, and I'm not going to do it because I'm out of time. Uh, you can go online, find this. Is a, uh, is a video from the Smithsonian talking about the, Cy- the Cyrus Cylinder. You can go find it. I stole it from YouTube, so you can find it there. Uh, the Cyrus Cylinder, and they talk about the translation and, and what he said in there. But 100, 200 years before he was even born, the prophecy was, you're going to be the one that's going, to, that's going to give the call for them to go back and rebuild the temple. And because of that, we're following this line, the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel is going to be one of the leaders. They're going to come back, Haggai and Zechariah, Malachi. They're the ones, the prophets are going to be encouraging the people to continue on. And what are they doing? They're coming back to rebuild the temple, return to the remnants of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to repair the walls of the city, to restore um, the restoration of the temple worship, the labors and reform of Ezra and Nehemiah, prophecies of Haggai and, and, and the canon of scripture. So you have this, you have this, Right here is the temple being rebuilt, right? Temple. So this is like more than you wanted to know about the temple. But, I, but here's the thing. I'm giving you this in, in like rapid fire, a lot of material, but this is all important for our Bible. What is the book in our Bible? What's the book of Nehemiah and Esther about? What is it about? It's about coming back into the land to rebuild the temple. What is Haggai talking about? Zechariah, what is Malachi talking about? You know, as, they, as the priests now have gotten wicked in their hearts and they've gotten to where they're, they're, they're totally misbehaving, Malachi is, is warning them and warning them and warning them. And then Malachi says one of the last echoing things that, that for 400 years there's going to be this silent until the coming of Christ. And he's the one that's going to say there's going to be a forerunner. There's going to be one that's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, and he gives the prophecy of John the Baptist. And so, so now... I will spend just a moment next time right here. In fact, you guys doing okay? How you doing? You guys doing okay? Good. Anybody, anybody fall asleep on me? All right. Ezra and Nehemiah. Let me do this. Let me do this. Okay. Um, mm. Okay. Do, do it on your own. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do this section because I want to get, I want to start next time. I want to start next time with this guy right here. This is what I want to start with next time. All right, this is going to get us lined up. All right, so this is a, this is a uh, menorah, but this is a specific menorah. This is a... Hanukkah. Okay, good, Hanukkah menorah. This is Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah? Jesus, here, extra credit, all right? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. The scripture says that. Okay, see if you can find it. Okay, there is, there, is a, there is a time that Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah? I wish Mel Gibson would have done what he said he was going to do. Mel Gibson said he's going to tell the story of the Maccabean revolt that took place there. Now, if you get a, if you get a, um, you get a Bible that's a Catholic Bible, okay, you'll notice from Malachi, or Malachi we call him, that famous Italian prophet, Malachi, Malachi, from Malachi to Matthew, we have, we have in our history line, of, we call it a 400 years of silence, meaning it's not that God is not, not doing things, but there's not angels or dreams or visions, but what's going on, the Catholic Bible now has, has books that are there. They're great for history, not good for doctrine, so, so you have these other books called the Apocrypha. First and second Maccabees is going to tell you the story of what happened during this Maccabean revolt, all right, revolt again, and Antechonius, say it, it I'm going to go in tongues. Antich- Antichonius, yes, that guy right there. He was a madman, all right? And so, but he, but, so he came in, desecrated the temple, and the Maccabean Revolt was the group that came over to, to recapture 
the Temple Mount area to recapture the temple, right? And so that's what that's all about. But you got to get ahead of that ahead of that story to get to this guy right here, okay? And whenever I think of Herod the Great, why is he called Herod the Great? Stay tuned. We'll get to that next time. Why I always think of this guy right here, because the Bible talks. the The history tells us that he was a little guy with a with a major attitude. And the only reason why we still honor him today is because he's called Herod the Great because of his building abilities. Like nobody else in that era, nobody could build. Even his tomb, even his tomb right there. This is a tell. This is, a, usually a tell is a, is a man-made hill, but it's, it's usually from civilization, conquered, over, you know, overlaid, next civilization, conquered, overlaid, burn layers, all the stuff that we've learned about tells, this is different. This is a man-made hill. This is a hill that he made, not in layers. He built it, put a palace up there, and this is where his tomb, this is where his, he was, his tomb's at. All right. I will tell you about that because what's fascinating about this, we, I went with um, Dr. Randall Price. We were looking for, look, he was looking for, I was following him around trying to keep up with that guy. You know, I mean, he, was, he almost killed me. Right? I'm a middle-aged fat guy, and this guy's so in shape. He's actually a guy that's been up Mount Ararat several times looking for Noah's Ark. Uh, he's a guy, he's, he's, he's here at the church several times. But, but uh, so I went up with him uh, looking at this mountain, trying to find Herod's tomb. We went right by, we were almost the ones that, we were almost, that's the best story of my life. I almost found it, all right? We went right by it. And praise God we didn't find it because the guy that found it, this guy right here, this guy found it, all right? I'll tell you his story because this guy spent his life trying to find Herod's tomb. And when he did find it, the tragic story about this guy's life is that, well, I'll tell you next time, all right? So, yeah, okay. Going right there. This is where we are going to get here next time, all right? The next time we will get to this picture right here because this is Herod's temple, all right? And so then I'll, be, I'll start taking you around uh, of what's there in Jesus' day and what's there today. So we're not, so this, it, gets, it gets a lot of, it gets fun from here, here on out. So how was that? That's a lot of material. That's a lot right there. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. All right. Let's, let's pray. Father, we love you and trust in you, Lord. Lord, as we are drinking out of a fire hydrant tonight, Lord, there's so much material. And Lord, we didn't do justice in the stories that we told tonight. And yet, like looking at Looking at uh, pictures, Lord, little snapshots of moments. Lord, as we looked at the pictures, we marveled at the story. We marveled at your goodness and your mercy, Lord. And then we moved to the next snapshot, Lord. Lord, I pray that we'd be a people that'd be hungry for the entire story. That, Lord, we'd go back and read once again where David had such a heart for you, Lord, wanting to build the temple. And Lord, you gave it to his son Solomon. And the things that we've learned tonight, the, the snapshots that we've looked at tonight, we love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us a desire to open your Bible, Lord, and to learn from your word. And Lord, continue to lead us on on these Wednesday nights, Lord, as we learn more and more about your Bible. We love you. We trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. All right, go home.